you. It's wonderful to be here today, and I'm so excited to to spend some time talking about real things, fake things, things that are less than genuine, um, all of these, all of these sorts of things that I um, dive into in my book, Genuine Fakes. Um, <clears throat> one of the one of the things that I wanted to do today um, is to talk broadly, thematically, about some of the work that I've done with this book, and then to dive into some of the examples, because the examples are just so much fun that, um, that it's, hard to, it's hard to not like them. All right, so with that, I'll sort of put this out here as, um, as a caveat. This is not a book about fake news. Um, and it's hard to imagine, I think, um, two words that have become more socially and politically charged in the last three years than fake news. Um, and I have to be honest, I, I actually really hate the phrase. Um, I hate how the phrase has morphed into sort of a blithe bit of cultural shorthand. Um, I hate that calling something a fake now makes it easier to unquestionably, unquestionably dismiss it out of hand. Um, and I think that one of the consequences of the fake news phenomenon is that how we think about the word fake today uh, carries an urgency that it might not have a decade ago. Um, and I think that, that one of the things that's really come through in my research with Genuine Fakes is that the, the fake in fake news um, sort of con conveys this idea that fakes are by definition bad and that non-fakes are inherently superior. And we think that it's very easy to distinguish between fake and real because we can sort of construct these neat little little categories and then sort things in between. You know, real, fake, real, fake. Um, but, but not all fakes are equal, and I would argue that not all fakes are problematic. Um, and that what consistently underscores objectionable fakes are elements of deception, of artifice, of fraud, and we rightly object when one thing is trying to be passed off as another. Um, and I maintain, and this is, this is sort of the thematic thing that I would hope that we take with us with genuine fakes is that the line between fake and not um, isn't only easily blurred, that it's not really a dividing line at all. It's really a continuum. All right, so with that sort of what the, what the book is not about, this is what the book is about. It's about eight awesome objects that I've, dove, that I've dived into. Um, and I think about genuine fakes as a biography of authenticity that's told through eight objects. Um, each chapter, each object, asks the reader to consider um, what makes something, that something, real, what makes it authentic, and how that has changed over time. And that's another big theme um, that comes up a lot in Genuine Fakes, is sort of how the historical context of objects determine how we think about them. Um, <clears throat> Andrew had asked me sort of what, what motivated me? How did, I, how did I find this topic? How did I find myself interested in exploring this topic? And in my previous book, Seven Skeletons, I spent time researching and writing about the Piltdown hoax, which is one of the most famous hoaxes in the history of science. Longest perpetrated, still largely unsolved, which is kind of exciting. Um, and the Piltdown hoax was a fake fossil that was made out of real bits of bone. So um, these real bits of bone that are put together and sort of uh, trick the scientific establishment into accepting it as a real fossil. And I wanted to, and I felt that that was a really key part in the story of why the Piltdown hoax was so pervasive and why it was so readily accepted, is that it was a fake thing made out of real bits. And I wanted to see if that was true with other material objects, um, or if fake stuff could be made real and authentic. And so that's sort of the, the motivation behind all of these. And so all of these are examples of cool, genuinely fake objects that you will find in genuine fakes. Uh, and today, I'd like to talk about, and so today I decided to dive in, to do a deep dive into two objects. Um, one of them that I'd like to talk about is authenticity and the story of laboratory-grown diamonds, which is really awesome. Uh, the first non-natural diamonds were made in General Electric's laboratory in December of 1954. Um, and in the 1940s, General Electric's laboratory in Shindectony, New York, was the center for synthetic diamond research, that although there were many laboratories around the world that were trying to solve this question of how do we grow diamonds, how do we make diamonds in a lab, uh, General Electric was sort of at the forefront of that research. Uh, the team that uh, was working on this question at General Electric was made up of Francis Bund, uh, Herbert Strong, 
H. Tracy Hall, Robert Wentworth, James Cheney, and was managed by uh, Anthony Narat. The project was codenamed Project Super Pressure. Um, and everyone was sworn to secrecy. Um, and so the project really drew on this, this uh, long standing, decades long sense of how do we create huge amounts of pressure in a laboratory setting. Um, and super pressure used different apparatuses in their experiments for years. The team devoted incredible time, effort, resources to this question. And by 1954, General Electric's kind of looking around and wants to know where their diamonds are. Um, and they haven't, they haven't been able to make any. Um, and the, and the, the management at General Electric began to worry that this question of laboratory-grown diamonds was going to be gimmicky at best and a total monetary sinkhole. And so by December of 1954, the team really needed to be able to produce concrete, tangible results. They needed to be able to make some diamonds in order to justify their work. All right, so with that, the sort of the tension, uh, hold that thought for just a minute, for a couple of minutes. Um, and I want to backtrack to talk through how people have thought about non-natural diamonds throughout history. Uh, because the question of non-natural diamonds isn't just a question of science and engineering. It's also a question of culture and history. All right. So, so I have some news for you guys um, that fake gems are nothing new. <laughs> which probably, I hope, doesn't come as a huge surprise. Um, it's sort of the great truism of the human condition. Uh, the earliest fake gems, or fake jewels, actually trace back to ancient Egypt, where glass was sometimes used to substitute for real things in burial goods. Um, and by the first century CE, the Roman author and famous natural historian Pliny the Elder um, took on this question of what he saw as rampant fake gems in the classical world. Um, in his famous book, uh, Natural History. And Pliny calls his readers' attention to the proliferation of fakes, uh, specifically instances where fraudsters are substituting cheap lookalikes for the genuine thing. So this is an instance of actually of, of taking glass and substituting it in for diamonds. And Pliny attributes the abundance of fakes to humanity's obsession with precious gems as, quote, there is no other kind of fraud practiced by which larger profits are made. Um, and so in order to combat what he saw as rampant gem fakery uh, and forgery and fraud in the classical world, Pliny offers what we might call a scratch test to be able to differentiate diamonds from fakes. So this is the first example of a scratch test being used um, in diamond history. And Pliny notes that real diamonds would scratch other minerals um, but not vice versa. And so, uh, and Pliny also actually has a, a whole chapter, it's, it's kind of ranty actually, and it's really funny, um, where he describes all of these other fake gems that are like creeping their ways into uh, the classical world. And he describes that if you really look at these fakes, you'll be able to quote, see the blisters in the body of the fictitious stones. These are filaments and they are unequal in brilliancy. And so, okay, so, so Pliny has all of these ways that he's disgusted with the, the fakes that are popping up in the gem market. Um, but he also offers some material means to be able to differentiate uh, the fakes from the real things. <clears throat> and so from, from the classical world, I want to fast forward a couple of centuries here, a couple of millennia here, um, and to talk about medieval fake gems. Um, and there are a plethora of reasons for people to make imitation gems. Um, some are legitimate, some not. So not, that's, that's the sort of Pliny um, example. And some of the non-natural gems were purposefully designed and commissioned uh, to ensure that they would be more permanent than the real thing. And this is a really sort of cool, twisty kind of example of why you would want, why people would want a non, quote unquote, real or non, quote unquote, natural uh, gemstone. So with, the, uh, so with the real thing, um, the real thing, it's such a bad turn of phrase in this, in talking about this book. But, but uh, for examples of uh, gold and jewelry and things where uh, gems are, are, are the actual natural examples, um, in the Middle Ages, people were finding that they were melted down, that they could be remade, and that actually if what people wanted was something that was legacy or going to endure, the, the odds were better that it could do that if it wasn't quote unquote real. And so I, I bring this up because there, I want to emphasize that there's this tradition that, um, of, of substituting 
the natural for, or substituting the non-natural for the natural, but without that sort of element of artifice that we would associate with sort of out and out frauds. All right, um, and so for more than millennia, uh, several artist handbooks, there were actually handbooks that, um, that were uh, curated and cared for and uh, collected to be able to sort of tell others, hey, this is the best way to you know, substitute the glass for the ruby or for the emerald or what have you. Um, and <clears throat> they would, these, these, these books were passed along as sort of crafts, uh, sort of ideas of craftsmanship. They were passed along as ideas of expertise. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they, they, were, they were used and they were, uh, they were very successful. The one thing that I do want to um, emphasize, however, is this quote uh, that comes from Albertus Magnus, the 13th century Dominican bishop that he writes in his Book of Minerals, that although art may imitate nature, nevertheless, it cannot reach the full perfection of nature. All right, and so even though that we're talking about legitimate reasons for substituting gems one thing for the other, there is this sense that it's not actually going to be able to obtain or be able to attain the, the sort of heights that it would be afforded in the natural world. All right, um, <clears throat> there's more than one way to make a fake. So we've talked about, I can, see, I can hear some, some snickering here, which is awesome. Um, <clears throat> there's more than one way to make a fake. And while substituting glass was an incredibly straightforward way of uh, creating less than genuine gemstones, there, um, there, the other way that was incredibly popular uh, during the Middle Ages uh, to create less than genuine gems was through alchemy. Um, so for those of you who wish to leave today and actually try and make some genuinely fake gems, I completely recommend this. Check out the historical um, recipes that are available at recipeshypotheses.org. They're fantastic. Um, and they've been, they've been um, put together by historian of science, Marilyn Ball. Um, and so with the, with the alchemy recipes, this was an example of gemstones that uh, were dyed to look like other things. So people would begin with uh, selenite or topaz or other things that are clear and dye them basically to look like emeralds or rubies or something like that. Um, and it's actually, it's incredibly effective, um, which was counterintuitive to me. I didn't know this until I started talking to uh, Marilyn about her work with this. And she points out that this drew from a lot of the same kind of research and expertise that was going into painting at the same time. And so the, the people that are creating uh, paints and pigments to be able to dye gemstones are actually doing it with a huge amount of expertise. Uh, the gullible gem buyer wouldn't have stood a chance. Um, <clears throat> and one of the, uh, let me, nope, nope. Nope, thought I had another slide, sorry about that. Um, so, oh, and the one thing I did want to mention with this particular slide is that the recipes for, um, for, talking, uh, for being able to create these alchemical recipes are compiled in a book called the Stockholm Papyrus. It has 72 how-to recipes, so in case you really are sort of looking for a project to do this Halloween uh, week, definitely recommend trying to make your own emeralds or rubies. I will also add that it is really hard that I did, I tried this, and my, my emeralds are never going to fool anybody. But I have, see, I have seen some examples that have been worked um, where the recipes have been tried out with sort of people with proper expertise, and they look fantastic. But I, again, I want to sort of emphasize that this is this example of sort of artifice, that these are, these are one thing that's being trying to be passed off as another. All right, <clears throat> so what about the natural thing? And so this kind of brings us back to, we're slowly circling back to our question of General Electric and diamonds. And what about the natural thing? What is a real or natural diamond made out of? Uh, and so we fast forward a couple of centuries here, and we come to the story of Antoine Lavoisier, who was an 18th century French chemist who's most noted for his discovery of the role that oxygen plays in combustion. And in the mid 18th century, chemists throughout Europe were interested in observing, defining, and documenting the physical properties of gems, minerals, and elements. And diamonds were no different. Lavoisier wanted to understand how the chemistry of combustion worked in diamonds. So again, remember he's working with these questions of sort of how, do, you know, what role does oxygen play in combustion? And so Lavoisier is interested in this question of combustion more generally. 
He's, and so, so he's working with this question with, with diamonds. Why would the hardest mineral in the world be changed from a shiny bright gem into charcoal? And why this couldn't happen with other gems? So this brings us to this truly awesome sort of moment in the history of science, where in, on April 25th, 1772, Antoine Lavoisier set some diamonds on fire. And this is just, like I said, this is just this great moment in the history of science. Um, so in that day in April, Lavoisier and his colleagues, the chemist Pierre Macré, the apothecary Louis-Claude Cadet, they burned their first diamond by putting the diamond in a crucible and then sticking the crucible in a furnace in the apothecary's workshop. And um, they, put, they put a plethora of other gems in there to sort of see what would happen. Hey, what happens when we burn the ruby? Um, and much, much to the, as, was, as historical sources describe, the shock and awe of people who are watching this experiment, including the Paris's eminent Duc de Croix, who is a fixture in popular intelligentsia circles in France. And he stops by, as, you know, as one does. He stops by and checks this out. And he says, I found the furnace is lit and everyone very busy. Monsieur Lavoisier, the farmer general, and the academy member, and somebody else were trying to distill a diamond, the Duc de Croix right? And you can almost hear this sort of you know, disbelief and shock in his voice, even you know, 200 years later. These experiments are putting an awful lot of diamonds in the fire. <laughs> so, so what does Lavoisier do? He concludes that he needs some more diamonds. <clears throat> and so with that, uh, Lavoisier orders this large six-wheeled platform machine. So, so that's the picture that you're looking at is Lavoisier's apparatus, sort of after he tries the, burning the, the diamonds in the fire and sees that it sort of creates this charcoal, he wants to know, he wants to know more about this. And so, so this is the apparatus that's going to help him know more about this. Uh, six wheels, um, it has space for eight or nine scientists to work. You can see Lavoisier there. Um, uh, sort of to the right, he's the one in the goggles. And so as part of the uh, apparatus, it has two massive burning lenses. They're convex lenses. Um, they're mounted at the end of the platform and that they could be manipulated through a series of cogwheels um, and could sort of track the sun's rays over time. Um, the lenses were eight feet in diameter and uh, were actually filled with 140 pints of alcohol as a way to make the lenses even thicker and to intensify and amplify the sun's rays. Uh, Lavoisier calls this a liquor lens. Uh, Lavoisier outlines a program of experiments and organizes all of the necessary materials for this. And a uh, historian of science, Jean-Pierre Portier, explains that a group of assistants were in charge of adjusting and moving the machine, while four scientists wearing wigs and dark glasses. I, and this is a complete aside that's probably really unprofessional, but I don't understand you know, having this kind of like reflective, refractive like, setup and wanting to wear a wig, but that's you know, just <laughs> me. OK, so, so they're wearing wigs, and they have dark glasses, and they proceed to test, installed as if it were at the edge of a poop deck of a ship. The experiment is set up on the Jardin Le Enfant and between the royal palace and the banks of the Seine. And, the, and um, elegant women and the curious were to stroll there and observe the scene with amazement, which one can only, one can only imagine. All right, so between August and October of 1772, Lavoisier conducts 190 experiments with the diamonds, metals, and other minerals. And between March and August of 1773, Lavoisier carries on an additional set of 19 experiments on diamonds specifically. Again, trying to understand what happens to diamonds, what, what kind of transformation of material is happening here. Um, <clears throat> what Lavoisier and his colleagues were left with each time were piles of charcoal, and in every instance of their diamond experiments, the amounts weighed the same amount as the diamonds did that they started with. And based on these experiments, as well as a number of others um, <clears throat> that were conducted over the next couple of years, Lavoisier concluded that charcoal and diamonds were simply forms of the same material. And when he publishes an updated list of chemical elements in 1789, he refers to this substance as carbon. All right. So we know that diamonds are made of carbon, and that heat and pressure transform diamonds. In, you know, uh, diamonds, and we know that heat and pressure transform carbon into diamonds. Could a diamond then be? Could could you reverse that? Could you actually make a diamond in a laboratory setting? 
Um, <clears throat> and, this is, and this is the question that's very much in the scientific establishment's mind in sort of the late 19th century. And on February of 1880, uh, the 25-year-old chem Scottish chemist, James Ballantyne Haney, uh, claimed that he had been able to actually make diamonds in his laboratory. And he sends them off to the British Museum to be authenticated and verified. Um, as a practicing chemist and metallurgist, Haney had observed that many substances, like silicon, aluminum, and zinc, were insoluble in water at normal temperatures and would largely dissolve in water vapor at high temperatures. And so Haney thought that a solvent uh, could be found for carbon that would allow the structure of carbon to rearrange itself. Um, it's and, and sort of using, um, using a seed diamond to get this process started. It's, uh, it's actually not unlike, if you think about sort of contemporary rock candy and how rock candy is made, it's, it's, it's a sort of similar thing that Haney is proposing. <clears throat> but obtaining the diamonds that Haney sends to the British Museum, so, so in theory, the, this sounds very straightforward, but the actual practice of how do, you, how do you actually make this, that's very difficult, as Haney found out. Um, so, so his experimental setup, and I know that you're not supposed to have favorite moments in the history of science, um, but this is, this is really one of mine. Um, so Haney uh, creates this incredibly um, complex, or this incredible experimental setup where he uh, has a series of rods that are about 20 inches long, about an inch thick, and have a half inch borehole that goes through. So he's basically building these pipes. <clears throat> and then he would use these pipes or these tubes, he would use them as crucibles and he would fill the, um, he would fill them about two thirds full of what he called a paraffin spirit, uh, bone oil mixture and would add in four grams of lithium, a pinch of lamp black for the carbon because you need the carbon and then would heat them to a dull red heat for 14 hours and then set them aside to cool. And again, I know you're not supposed to have favorite moments, but this is really one of my favorite moments. Um, <clears throat> finding a way to seal the tubes is not an insignificant problem for Haney. Um, you can't just screw a, a cap on the end. And so what Haney opts to do is he, um, he has these, these sort of miniature balls made that are going to fit the diameter of the tube. And he puts them in there and he crimps them in there. And um, it turns out, it turns out that this just doesn't work. It sort of inevitably, invariably, and always turns these tubes into little miniature cannons as soon as he heats them. And he sort of sort of renders his laboratory. It's like, it's like a battlefield in there um, as you know, tubes are exploding and balls are going everywhere. And, and it's, all, it's all very hectic. And Haney acknowledges that, that this, this is difficult. Um, <clears throat> what is it? The experiments too few, the evidence too vague, lots of explosions. These are all in his, in his notes. Um, and nine times out of 10, the iron tubes explode, um, destroying the furnace, their contents, uh, terrifying his workers um, who are quitting left and right. Um, and, but of the few tubes that survive Haney's sort of tender ministrations here, um, most of the carbon inside had either evaporated or that it's soft and scaly, um, as Haney reports to the British Society, or the Royal Society. But there are three tubes. There are three tubes that have these small crystal-like these small crystal-like diamonds that are inside of them. And Haney is convinced that these are that this is that these are diamonds, and that these diamonds have been made as a result of the heat and pressure that he's subjected this to. Um, these are what he mails. These are these are authenticated by the British Museum as real diamonds. Um, and so it would seem that we have the first instance of a laboratory-grown diamond. Um, there's, there's, there's this sort of interesting sort of uh, footnote to the story that we can go into in the question and answer period, um, where, where the question of whether Haney is actually successful in making laboratory-grown diamonds is a bit dicey. Um, there is some historical evidence that his workers were so terrified of what was happening in the laboratory that they actually put real diamonds, like natural diamonds, they put them in the tubes to sort of put a, to see if they could, you know, put a, put a halt to this. Um, and, so, and so the jury, the historical jury is a little bit out onto whether or not Haney, you know, is, ought to be credited with the first or not. But uh, regardless, I like this sort of truism of the human condition of like, nope, we've got to, we've got to stop the, you know, exploding tubes here. 
Um, and so I also want to point out that Haney is not the only person who is working on this question of how to make laboratory-grown diamonds. Uh, the French chemist Henri Moissan um, is working on this question. American Charles Parsons, uh, with, who, in, or, uh, excuse me, um, Charles Parsons, who's working on the compound steam turbine, is also working on this question, and none of them are very successful. Oh, H.G. Wells actually writes this truly atrocious bit of science fiction called The Diamond Maker. Um, so if there's any H hardcore H.G. Wells fans who want to be truly disappointed, check out The Diamond Maker. Um, but there's this sense that how to make diamonds is an open question for scientists and engineers. And so, OK. So now we get to fast forward back. Remember how I said to sort of hold your thought and to we'd come back to Project Super Pressure. This is all of the historical contingency and the historical context that Project Super Pressure is, is dealing with and is fronted with. All right. Uh, so uh, Project Super Pressure uh, begins uh, a new experimental run on December 8th, 18, uh, 1954. Herb Strong begins experiment 151. Uh, setting the pressure cone apparatus to 50,000 atmospheres, it cranks the temperature up to 1,250 degrees Celsius, and deposits a carbon and iron mixture um, in addition to seed diamonds to start the process. And as a, as a side note, uh, seed diamonds were considered to be sort of the best bet um, for, for growing laboratory diamonds. Um, there has been some evidence going, coming out of the Soviet Union that this was a really good way. This, this was the most promising track. So most of his earlier experimental runs were short. There were a couple of hours at most. And uh, he decides to let it run overnight, actually. And the morning of December 9th, two seed crystals tumble out. Um, and there's this sort of blob at the end of the, at the, end of the uh, tube there. And uh, they send it off to the metallurgy division to be polished. And metallurgy, uh, a bit miffed, sends it back and says, hey, it's breaking our polishing wheel. Um, and so there's this sort of moment of, well, what, could, what, could, what would be strong enough to break your polishing wheel? And there's this, there's this sense then that, wait, this is, this is the diamond. Um, and it's actually subsequently uh, confirmed with x-ray analysis that these are, this was a laboratory-grown diamond. Uh, the next day, uh, H. Tracy Hall actually performs a similar experiment, but by himself. Uh, the previous one, experiment 151 is done in sort of a collaboration with a couple of other folks that are working as part of Project Super Pressure. Hall does an experiment on his own um, <clears throat> using an older bit of technology uh, that, he had, that he had worked with extensively. He adds two diamond seed crystals to an iron sulfate and then places everything in a cylindrical graphite heater. Um, following the protocol, he heats, um, he, he, what does he do? He heats it, oh, to 1,600 degrees Celsius and puts it under 100,000 atmospheres of pressure. And uh, he does this for 38 minutes. So in sort of the same time you can make a lasagna, you can apparently <laughs> make a diamond. Um, so Hall opens this, he's very excited, he can see it. And, and sort of there's this, there is this sort of wa like voila moment that this is a diamond. And um, I'd like to call your attention specifically to the notebook that, that you can see there on the left-hand side of the slide. Uh, there on the 16th is made first diamonds, GE. And I just like to think that, you know, I don't know what's on the next page, like, you know, your dental appointment, something. But here, here, here it is. And um, for those of you that are interested in any of the notes or sort of surrounding cool stuff, surrounding cool ephemera from that, I would definitely recommend checking out the uh, website that's down below there. All of the materials are from the uh, Tracy Hall family, that they have some really cool stuff that's up there. All right. Um, so there's this question that suddenly in the, in the space, you know, having gone years, and suddenly in the space of one week, there are two different methods that are, that are good for creating these diamonds. Um, <clears throat> eventually, Hall's method is the one that's uh, easily replicatable, so that's the method that GE goes with. Oh, I should also note that um, they're not without a sense of humor. Um, and that in December of 1955, Robert Wentworth goes to the local food co-op in New York and buys his favorite type of crunchy peanut butter, brings it back to the lab, scoops out a little bit, sticks it on the belt, and they actually send it through and you can make it you can make a diamond out of peanut butter. And uh, sort, of, sort of demonstrating that, again, this is this question of car you know, a carbon-based source could be, turned into, uh, could be turned into a diamond given enough heat and pressure. All right. 
So we can do it. But what does the diamond industry think about this? Um, this is one of my most favorite quotes um, from uh, Sir Ernest Oppenheimer, the then president of De Beers in 1950. So De Beers kind of gets wind, right? That there are all of these experiments like, hey, people are trying to, trying to make these diamonds. And he says, only God can make a diamond. Um, and so apparently God has no problem four years later with uh, General Electric doing the same thing. All right, uh, so what does the diamond industry think? And a lot of the diamonds that are first being produced by GE are industrial grade diamonds. They're used for industrial purposes. Um, but the gem and jewelry side of the diamond industry, and so with the industrial side, there's the, it's great. This is wonderful. We have you know, readily access, ready access to all of these kind of industrial diamonds. But the jewelry and gem side of the diamond market are really hesitant. Um, and they quickly sort of work to create a rhetoric and to align themselves with the idea that this is not a real diamond. Like if you can grow it in a lab, it's not, it's not a real diamond. Um, there's this, there's some great quotes about um, from the uh, Gemological Mineral Association that talk about sort of like, oh, it's like going, trying to catch a fish in like a salmon fishery, you know, how hard could it possibly be? Um, <clears throat> and so the, the jewelry market is very, very dismissive of accepting these as real or authentic diamonds. And I want to emphasize that it's not just GE. So sort of over the next couple of decades here in the 20th and 21st century, it's not just GE and industrial diamond making. New companies and new technologies for making the diamonds are developing. There's even um, here in the 21st century a huge push for memorial diamonds, if we, if we want to get into that in the question and answer session, which is definitely different. Um, <clears throat> all right. But so, so we've sort of answered this question of, OK, you can make a diamond. How do you make it authentic? How do you make it real? How do you make it culturally acceptable? How do you make it equivalent? Um, and I would like to point out then, the diamonds have changed a great deal since the 1950s. And so at that point, in the 1950s, De Beers really had the, corner, uh, had the market cornered on uh, diamonds and for jewelry and for industry with that. Um, and, for, and now, De Beers really doesn't. De Beers holds uh, approximately 35% of the world's diamonds now. Um, and in sort of in addition to not having a complete monopoly of the market, De Beers has also experienced some pushback from its customers. That for a, the majority of the 20th century, um, De Beers customers were cajoled, manipulated, persuaded. Um, into believing the, that a diamond engagement ring was a cultural necessity for sort of the, to demonstrate success in the middle class. And now customers are really pushing back uh, with that. Um, they've also pushed back for ethical reasons, um, concerns about conflict diamonds or environmental impact of mining, which leads us to sort of how, how here in 2019, do we, what do we think and what do different think of laboratory-grown diamonds. So I'd like to juxtapose here. Um, one is the, the picture on the right is Lightbox, which is actually uh, De Beers line, a line of uh, laboratory-grown diamonds that De Beers launched in 2018. Um, that's a, what is, it, what is it called? A low-budget or starter diamond with mass market appeal. Uh, light box, they come in pink, blue, white. They're targeted for the Sweet 16, the bridal party gifts. Those sorts of things, um, and when uh, when the line launches in 2018, the uh, head of marketing uh, gives this great quote to the New York Times um, that these that the laboratory grown diamonds are for the self purchasing professional, the younger woman, the older woman who already has a jewelry collection, as well as any woman who doesn't want the weight and seriousness of a real diamond for everyday life. So one, it's incredibly patronizing. And two, it's, it's a really interesting statement to be making about what is real and what is authentic. Um, <clears throat> and so I'll, I'll sort of juxtapose that with the one on the, the left, which is from the Diamond Foundry, which is a company that says, this is great. Of course, the, of course we made them. Why wouldn't we make them? This is a more ethical way because of con concerns about conflict diamonds or environmental impact. This is a more uh, ethical and therefore a more authentic kind of diamond. And so we're sort of seeing these two play out right now. Um, and oh, I'll just throw this out. This is, um, this is a great bit of marketing, this sort of real is rare, real is a diamond. Um, this was actually, um, 
a bit of marketing that my husband found uh, going to work last week, um, where it was the ad that was flashing in the elevator. And so he very nicely rode the elevator for 20 minutes, waiting for the ad to flash back so he could take a picture so I could include it with this. Um, but I want to, and I include it, because I want to emphasize that that there's this, this open question now here in the 21st century of, OK, we can replicate it. This isn't a glass substitution. This isn't alchemy sort of coloring one thing to look like another. We, can, we, can under, we understand the carbon structure, and we can make it. But what makes it authentic? And that's going to be sort of the next cultural leap. All right, so I want to, I want to sort of take a minute here um, and to talk about a, a slightly different theme um, than the diamond ones, which is a different, which is another theme that pops up in, um, in the book. I thought about wearing the nose and the glasses and the stuff here, and something. The publicist was like, "Are you kidding me? No, it's really unprofessional." Um, so yeah, so th so there's that. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I want to talk about um, are what happens to fakes after they're debunked. So OK, so we've spent all of this time exploring the world of laboratory-grown diamonds. And the, there, there's this sort of question of real, and that maybe fake isn't the right label to be using with diamonds. But what about the fake fakes, like the things that are actually fake and are, forged, are forgeries and frauds and were never anything else? I wanted to explore the question of what happens to them after they're debunked. Because they don't disappear. You know, They're still around. Um, and so. Uh, I want to spend a couple of minutes here this afternoon talking about art fakes that become genuinely collectible. Um, and so I think that there isn't a better example of this than this artist called the Spanish Forger. Um, and he came to sort of popular consciousness or sort of popular um, awareness in 2012 when a London-based auction house, Bonhams, began um, auctioning off one of the premier 20th century collections of fakes that actually included a couple of Spanish forgers as well. Um, which brings up this really interesting question, I think, of, wait a minute, you collect fakes. And secondly, these are worth this much? And the answer is yes. And I think that this gets at this question of what happens to the fake after it's been debunked. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the Spanish Forger, because it's an awesome story. Um, and then I think that, that we'll have some time to, to explore sort of these questions of authenticity and fakes and realness. So the Spanish Forger, the story of the Spanish Forger actually begins in 1930, uh, when the chief librarian of the J.P. Morgan Library, Belle de Costa Green, was asked to authenticate uh, this painting, actually, that you're looking at here. It's called The Betrothal of St. Ursula. And it was purportedly painted by a 15th century artist, Jorge Inglés. And the Metropolitan Museum of Art wanted to buy it. And they had had their guy come out. They, he authentic, excuse me, their guy, Count Umberto Noli, which sounds much, <laughs> much more sophisticated than that guy. So anyway, so, so, so Count Noli uh, authenticates it. And the Met wants a second opinion. So they take it to Belle de Costa Green. Um, and she looks at it and kind of looks at it and looks at it some more. Um, and and I want to point out a couple of things here about this painting before we get to Belle de Costa Green's opinion. So this is a really idyllic kind of painting. You see the little trees that are kind of popping up in the background there. Um, you can see the sort of Lancelot and Guinevere couple that are kind of working their way down the path. Um, it's, very, it's very happy. You see the people with their little mouths sort of pursed up into the little bows. Um, it really sort of looks like something out of like Walter Scott's Ivanhoe, right? Um, and Belle de Costa Green takes a, this is a close up of it, uh, takes a look at this and decides that there's just something really hinky about it. Um, it. She goes through all of these different aspects and says, you know, it actually looks too medieval. It's too perfect. And as it turns out, she was right. Um, the panels are cracked, but they're conveniently cracked in a way that doesn't actually uh, cut through any of the figures. Um, and um, so she goes back to Count Nolly and says, uh, nope, it's, it's not real. The Met, by the way, declines to buy it. 
Um, and, uh, and she christens the artist the Spanish forger because she had been checking, she had, she had thought that it was going to be um, a Jorge Inglés. And so Spanish forger nickname kind of sticks. And for the next couple of decades, uh, Bill de Costa Green starts collecting a catalog of all of the Spanish forgers that she finds. And once she knows what to look for, there are tons of Spanish forgers that she starts uncovering. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the Morgan Library, uh, who very kindly uh, let us take a look at the painting here today. All right, yeah, a couple of other, uh, a couple of other uh, pieces. These are all Spanish forgers that we're going to work through. Um, <clears throat> the Spanish forger began painting his work in the late 19th century, uh, early 20th century, and all of the Spanish forger pieces actually start going into the collector's market at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, uh, so, and when Belle de Costa Green is systematically going through and looking at that, she actually finds an example in the Morgan Library. She had authenticated a piece in 1909, uh, or a piece that, uh, that had been collected in 1909. She had authenticated it, and when she took a second look, now that she knew what to look for, she said, oh, actually, this is the Spanish Forger. Uh, Spanish Forger pieces show up. Uh, there are some at the Met. Uh, there's also one at, uh, oh, where is, oh, the British Museum. Um, has a miniature painted by the Spanish forger that depicts Hernando Cortez landing in Mexico. Um, and in short, I want to emphasize that the Spanish forger forgeries had, ho had hoodwinked many an expert. Um, and one of the other things that I'd like to point out with that is that the Spanish forger's identity actually today remains unknown. Um, uh, art historians have no idea sort of who, who this person was, whether it was a man, whether it was a woman, what nationality, they, that the Spanish forger really is one of these sort of great unsolved mysteries of, um, of, the, uh, of the art world. Um, so I, I'll just point out a couple of Spanish forger tells so that you can all feel like, as soon as I learned these, I felt very excited. I felt like I could, I was like this art authenticator at that point. Um, so a couple of really great Spanish forger tells that you would not see in genuine medieval paintings. Um, like we talked about the little tiny like bow mouths. Um, that's a good one. Uh, the fact that all of the uh, scenes are painted um, to reflect sort of jousting and revelry and sort of all of the great secular parts of medieval life. You know, who wants to buy a painting that's, you know, about religion? We want to sort of show falconry and chess and all of these great things. Um, lots of sort of women in pointy wimples, all of that. Uh, and one of the other really, uh, really classic Spanish forger tells are, um, the, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to come up. There are so many different turns of phrase that have been used for, for this particular tell is uh, daring decolletage, um, where all of the women look like they're in sort of this, they're about to experience this serious like medieval wardrobe malfunction. <laughs> and this is, I want to emphasize that this is not how the Middle Ages painted the Middle Ages, but this is very much how the 19th and early 20th century would have painted the Middle Ages, sort of envisioning like what, um, what people, what, what their buyers would want. So yeah, and once you see it, you can't unsee it. Um, and so one of the, so here sort of to, to sort of as we, and so uh, let, me, let me backtrack to the, to the Spanish forager. I want to emphasize that these are really collectible, that as recently as 2016, Antiques Roadshow has authenticated, somebody found a Spanish forger, it's authenticated, um, and they sell for tens of thousands of dollars, but they sell as genuine Spanish forger forgeries. And so there's this sort of meta level that's happening with this. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to emphasize, um, as we've talked about this continuum of authenticity, is that it is a continuum. And so one of the objects that I do spend some time in the book talking about is the Maya Grolier Codex, which for decades was thought to be this fake thing. It turns out to be authentic. It, it was authenticated. And so I, that's one of the reasons that I want to emphasize that sort of how we think about real, how we think about fake, how the sort of material lives of this can change. Um, I've thrown in the, the Grolier Codex as an example of it being able to go the other way. All right, so in short here, um, Genuine Face is about the material lives of things, um, ways to unpack what we think is real, what we think is fake, how that changes over time. And I really want to emphasize that this is very dependent on its history and its context. Um, and that as, we, as we've talked about sort of what are, what are our concerns about fake? How does this become this label? How does it become a way to dismiss? That it really is a way of emphasizing um, 
that it really is a way of needing to emphasize a context. Um, so if you enjoyed the stories of the Spanish forger, of the laboratory grown diamonds, Genuine Fakes has fake fossils, other art forgeries, Shakespearean forgeries, which are fantastic, uh, wildlife documentaries, uh, replicas of archaeological sites, and Banksy and Warhol, to name a few. Um, I'd like to sort of open out the question, the question time here and see, and see what, what you guys think and see what, uh, what questions you might have about things that are genuinely fake. Thank you. I shouldn't really be asking a question given that I'm the host, but it, just as a, as a heads up, if you want to ask a question, just line up okay. uh, behind the microphones. Uh, just for one second, I do have an actual question. You okay. mentioned nature documentaries. Yes. Uh, can you give us a minute why you considered that to be somewhere on the authentic to fake spectrum? Sure. So um, uh, there have been plenty of examples in nature documentaries where footage that's shown as this is real nature is is not real nature. It's um, staged, or it's uh, deceptive, or, or it's all of these things. Uh, the classic example is the lemmings. I, OK, I see, I see people nodding. The sort of white wilderness, the 1950s Disney documentary. Uh, documentary, it's, <laughs> anyway. Um, and the Alaska Game and Fish Department actually has like an entire web page about this is not true. Uh, please stop asking me about the lemmings. Um, I, think, I think that that's what the Alaska Game and Fish website really wants to say, but they're very professional about debunking this. Um, and so one of the questions that I wanted to explore in this is when is it ethical? When is it OK? To, there, are, there are legitimate reasons to, ha to show footage from animals in zoos or animals that are not in nature the way we're looking at it being sort of presented in nature. And with that chapter, I actually juxtapose it with um, uh, live stream nature cams and sort of ask, like, OK, what, is, what, are, what are the trade offs? We have one that's scripted and one that's unscripted. These are both presenting real nature, but they're doing it in very different ways. And sort of asking people to sort through what, what the different contexts are. So yes, there's a long discussion about walrus camps, so that's why I had all of the, the walrus photos. Yeah. Terrific, I love it. Um, what is the market for Spanish forgers now? Are these museums trying to offload them? Oh, are, no, are the no, they, act, no they want their Spanish forgers. They want, they want to keep their Spanish forgers, and now they're just called Spanish forgers. But the Met declined to buy the... They declined to buy that one in 1930. Well, the price was too high. No, they just said, it's fake. I don't want it. Take it, take it away. Go do something else with it. Um, and so in 1930, that was very much the, the sense. Um, and so when Bella da Costa Green starts sort of going through their collection, saying, oh, by the way, they, um, they sort of quietly file it. But it's, but it's there. Yeah. But... Um, the, and as I did mention, that the Spanish forgers, they do sell for tens of thousands of dollars at this point. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm a quest, question about the motivations. Uh, the motivations, for example, the creating the synthetic diamonds, or the lab-grown lab diamonds, was that for monetary purposes or for pure scientific curiosity? That's a really good question, uh, because motivation is so hard to sort of unpack. Um, for why is General Electric pursuing this as a research agenda? I think it's both. Um, I think that General Electric is certainly looking at you know what kinds of what kinds of applications can industrial diamonds offer, um, and certainly are are looking for ways to be able to um, to sort of corner the market with the technology to do so. Um, they weren't like trying to compete with De Beers. No, no, it was just. On some level, you kind of you almost want to ascribe this like, hey, can we do this? This is really cool. Um, but they're certainly looking at it sort of from an industrial perspective. Um, by the end of the 1950s, however, they are making or they are making uh, gem grade quality diamonds. Um, and at that point, that's when De Beers really starts to kind of take a step back. And actually, De Beers um, after. Uh, General Electric sort of demonstrates that they've done this. Uh, De Beers actually starts their own laboratory, uh, trying to sort of uh, trying to make uh, diamonds in order to sort of corner that market as well. Um, but they're years behind in the research, um, and there are several other laboratories. Uh, Novosibirsk in Siberia is actually also doing laboratory-grown diamonds at the same time. So De Beers, De Beers never really quite gets it the way General Electric does. Thanks. Yeah. 
Hi, thank you for the talk. I'm sorry if I missed this in the first 10 minutes, but another, I think, super rich area for the, the fake genuine discussion is fashion. Oh my goodness, yes. Yeah, I, like, um, and I feel like there's opinions across the spectrum on this. There's, a, there's some people that think it's okay that we have replicas of designer stuff because they should never have been that expensive. And others that think there was such a value in the history of a fashion house that that's why they're so expensive. But regardless, I'm wondering if you have done research on this, if you have opinions on, on this. So I'm so excited that you brought up that, um, that example. Um, so when I was originally outlining and designing this book, it had 25 chapters. And my editor took one look and was like, oh no. No, people are going to need a forklift to like move this book. Um, and so one of the one of the examples um, that I had thought about including in that first iteration did look at fashion, sort of the what does it mean to make ready to wear? That this is this is an entire thing that is based on it being replicatable and sort of a copy. Um, and so I think that um, I ended up taking up a similar kind of question with replicas of archaeological sites at the point that the copy is actually serving a social function or serving a social purpose. And so um, I don't have a specific answer to your question about fashion um, other than I think that um, I think that it's one that's, uh, that's very much under debate. But certainly the experience that I had diving into this question of the ethics of creating replicas for sort of other social needs was very much one that came up in, uh, in relation to creating replicas of heritage sites. Hello. Um, authenticating Hi. things is always really important to us here at Google, um, especially online things. I was wondering if you could share any anecdotes maybe like from the art world or the diamond world about how they authenticate things and decide if something is really authentic or not. All right, actually, I'm going to, uh, the example that pops into my mind that I think is really relevant to uh, what you're asking actually um, comes back to the uh, fake fossil that I talked about at the very beginning called the Piltdown Man. And when the Piltdown was discovered, it was discovered in 1912, and there weren't any kind of chemical analyses or any kind of what we would call quote unquote scientific tests to run, that it was, that authenticating the find meant sort of finding, authenticating the fossil meant sort of seeing where it had been found in the ground, looking at that, looking at the fossil itself and comparing it to other fossil species, and then sort of saying, yeah, that, that, looks, that looks pretty good. There were some hesitations and some questions that scientists had raised, sort of saying, eh, it looks kind of hinky, it doesn't look quite right. But, um, but it's not until the 1950s when um, chemical analyses are available and potassium argon dating is available to be able to really test the Piltdown fossil and to be able to say, well, we have, in addition to these sort of qualitative concerns, now we have this sort of quantitative edge to it. And so, and so, and so it's debunked at that point. And so I would say that so one of the things that seems to come up consistently, regardless of whatever uh, material object you're talking about, whether it's a fossil or art or, or, or gems, um, is that there's a balance between the qualitative and the quantitative and in a, the process of authenticating something, that it sort of looks right or it looks wrong, and then how does that sort of stack up against um, the sort of more quanti qual uh, quantitative analyses? So that's a kind of a roundabout way of answering your question. No, thanks, that was great. Okay. <laughs> thanks, everyone.